A story that I'm going to tell you now is one that I think is really interesting, and it's about Alice Tankerville. Alice Tankerville Wolf is her full name. So Alice Tankerville Wolf is the only woman to have a story like this, and I think she's really interesting. So her story begins in October of 1531. Henry VIII was getting a shipment of about 366 gold crowns from the Hanseatic League. This money was worth about a million pounds. And it was because he was under fire at this point from the Catholic countries. This is when he's divorcing Catherine of Aragon, not quite marrying Anne Boleyn yet, um, but he's not in favor with the Catholic countries. But the Protestant Hanseatic League wanted to help him out. And so they sent this money. So the ship arrived in London and Henry had sent some people down to meet it. And there was this chest on board. It was iron, securely locked, chained to the floor of the ship, kept under constant guard. And when Henry's men arrived, the, sh- the uh, chest itself was empty. The money had all gone. So of course, the Hanseatic League is really upset about this. And so they start an investigation. The investigation lasted for two years. And eventually, it seemed like the evidence pointed to a fellow called John Wolfe. John Wolfe was a thief, a pirate, a general thug around town. And there wasn't really that much evidence to connect him. He had been a member of the crew that was on board when the ship landed or docked. And that was kind of the only evidence, but people kind of had a feeling that he was the person. So he was taken to the tower and he was going to be charged with conspiracy, theft, and treason. He had a wife called Alice. Alice was probably his common law wife and whether or not they were actually married is up for debate. But for the purposes of this, we'll call her his wife. So she would come and she would bring him treats and things like this. This was a period when prisoners had to provide their own furniture, their own clothing, pay for their own food. So she would come and bring him things, bring him clothing. And while she did that, she would charm the guards. She was a very charming person, made friends with the guards, especially two fellows called William Dennis and John Baud. And, you know, they flirted a little bit. Alice was very, very charming. She was possibly a prostitute, um, but, you know, she knew how to how to work her natural graces. And so John Baud in particular started to fall for Alice. After about six months, the case against Wolf falls apart and he's released. And he decided that the best place for him to be was not in the country. So he left for Ireland. But he did ask John Baud to watch over Alice while he was gone. John Bond's only too happy to agree to that. Um, But then Wolf leaves, and soon after he leaves, there's actually new evidence that linked Wolf to the theft of the 366 gold crowns. And also that new evidence implicated Alice as a potential accomplice. So the Hanseatic League really wanted to get this handled quick like, and they didn't want to have to go and chase after John Bond, who everybody knew had left. They didn't want to deal with all that. So they decided to try Alice and John by Parliament in absentia. So essentially, Alice was being charged and convicted of a crime while she was in London, but she didn't even know about it. And during all that time, she was visiting her new friend, John Bond. She was, you know, seen around the tower basically just visiting her friends. And she wasn't even told of the charge until after the trial. So she was found guilty and she hadn't even been notified that she was found guilty. And then there was a warrant for her arrest. So meanwhile, while all of this is going on, Wolf returns from Ireland and he has a scheme to make even more money. So she had befriended two foreign merchants. Alice had befriended two foreign merchants. She had even been to their rooms, their chambers, and she knew how much money they had, kind of a general idea. She knew they were really, really wealthy. Why she was in their chambers, I'm not sure, but she was there. So make of that what you will. So they had this plan that they were going to take the money by murdering the men. So they lure them, her and Wolf lure them to the river. They kill them on boats. Um, they tie them up, throw their bodies in the water, and then they take the keys before they did all that. They took the keys to their rooms. Now, because the crime was on the water, Alice was officially a pirate now at this point. Crime's on the water, you're a pirate. So Alice is now a pirate. She takes the keys from the men, like I said. She breaks into their homes to rob them, but they were caught and arrested. So now Alice is a pirate, implicated in this other theft from the Hanseatic League. It's not looking very good for her. So one prosecutor wrote a letter to Cromwell that we still have a record of pleading for Cromwell to intercede in this, making sure she is punished and locked up. And he said that 
He was worried that if the diabolic woman escapes, we shall be in great jeopardy. So Alice had a reputation. She was put in the Cold Harbor Tower and not just put in a cell, but she was also chained into her cell. And because her and Wolf were pirates, they were tried in the Court of Admiralty and they were sentenced to hang upon the Thames at low watermark in chains and the rising tide would drown them, which would be horrifying, I think. Alice did not want this to happen to her, and she decided she was going to hatch a plan. One of the things was all of her old friends at the tower were feeling sorry for her. They liked her, they knew her, and it was hard to see her as this murderer, pirate person when you know, she was their friend. And she was being treated very harshly. Um, seeing a woman in the tower to start with and then chained, it, it was unusual. So they began to feel sorry for her and decided to help her come up with a plan to escape. William Dennis himself was one of the earlier guards that had guarded Wolf, and he was a visitor to her cell. And he decided that he would show her a secret way how she might be conveyed out of the tower. But then people started to get suspicious of William Dennis, and he was actually dismissed for fraternizing with the prisoner. So then comes back her old friend, John Baud, and he arranges so that he can become her guard and was there almost every day. And they start to build up their friendship again, probably talk about a potential romance if she could get out. And John Bod is basically smitten at this point. So they hatch a plan. Bod had sent through some men's clothing to her, also some rope, and a key to the outer door of the prison. So one thing is that her prison door was not that well locked. <laughs> These weren't really impressive locks. Uh, they weren't modern locks. There was just some old bone that was pinning it shut, pinning her door shut. So she was actually able to reach under her cell door and kind of wiggle things around and shake it and get it loose and poke at it. And she knocked it out. Now, John Bott actually knew all the schedules that were going on. He was very high up in rank and he knew everybody's schedule and when the shift changes were. So he had arranged that you know nobody would be right at her door and they would be leaving at a time when the shifts were just changing and there wouldn't be as many people around. So she dressed up in the men's clothes that Bod had given her, and she left her cell and made her way out of the Cold Harbor Tower, and she went up to the top of St. Thomas's Tower above what we call Trader's Gate now. And there John Bod was waiting for her. At this point, she had gotten out of her tower, she had gotten out of the main part of the prison, and there was still a moat around the tower at that point, and that was basically the only obstacle to her freedom if they could get across that moat. And so Bod has a boat waiting and they go across the moat and head in the direction of St. Catherine's Dock east of the tower and close to about where Tower Bridge is now. And then they decide they're going to walk up the hill and they have horses waiting for them. There was a friend called Jeffrey Harrison who Bod had talked to who had these horses waiting for them. And the plan was that they were going to stay at his house until everything died down. And then they were going to make their way to Europe and probably have a romance or maybe meet up with some of Wolf's friends, but start a new life together in Europe. But first they have to get to those horses. So they're walking up this hill. She's dressed in her men's clothing. And it all seems like it's so close to happening, just so close. But then some watchmen arrive early. Bod had thought he had it all scheduled properly, but this one watch arrives early. And in that group was a fellow called Gore, who was a friend of Bod. So he recognizes Bod. And he's like, oh, you know, hey, mate, what's up? And Bod's like, nothing. I'm good. Everything's normal. This is all very normal. There's nothing to see here. But Gore gets a little bit suspicious because it's pretty clear that there's something not exactly right. And he checks out this man who's walking with Bod and realizes that it was actually a woman. Another person in that watch, that group of watchmen, had actually been Alice's guard at one point. So he recognized her. And of course, you can imagine where this is going from there. It all ends with Alice and Bod both being taken back to the tower. Things did not go well for Bod because he... Yeah, this was really bad for someone who had been a guard to turn like this. So he was tortured as part of his punishment. 
He was placed in the cell, the Little Ease cell, which you may have heard about before. It was the one where you could not stand up or sit down. So you were constantly in this kind of weird position, trying to stretch out your limbs and not being able to. It was also dark, didn't have any windows. And then he was also racked because they wanted to find out whether there were any foreign parties involved in this escape at this point. And he kept saying, no, there wasn't anybody. He said that he acted only out of the love and affection that he bare to Alice. Basically, he was in love with Alice, and that was the only reason they did anything like this. So then they figured they got all the information out of Bod that they could, and he was hanged. And then both Alice and John Wolfe had their original punishments. They were strung up on the wall of the river at low tide. And Edward Hall says, at last she and her husband, as they deserved, were apprehended, arraigned, and hanged at the foresaid turning tree where she hanged still and was not cut down until such time as it is known that beastly and filthy wretches had most shamefully abused her while being dead. So basically, they left her out for scavengers for a while. Not pleasant. And, you know, I don't blame her for trying to avoid that. So that's the story of Alice Tankerville. 